Hello, happy innovators. Happy, happy, happy. Happy fun time. Yay. We get another podcast. Let's do it. So I left off, right, on my 50th episode of the Singularity Podcast. This is the 51st. Um, I left off talking about different artists that I consider to be inspiring or heroes to me. And I left off with Anya and Enigma, talking about them. But, you know, I told you, I hadn't even gotten like halfway through my list. Okay, so back to talking about what inspires me. You know, me, me, me. Let's talk about me again. But, hey, you know, (laughs) I do the best I can. I haven't figured out how to interview other people yet. You know, how to make that happen. But probably because no one really wants to talk to me. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Like, it's not on my end, man. It's hard to find people that want to really just commit, you know, sit down and interview and talk. Um, Enough about that. Because it doesn't really matter. Um, okay, so we're, we left off with Enigma and Enya, okay? Now, that brings me to a couple of other artists that I probably should have mentioned first, but it doesn't really matter. It's neither here nor there. But Brian Eno, the producer, the famous producer, famous musician. He's worked with U2. He's worked with Coldplay. You know, he's just, in my mind... When it comes to generating music, creating new sounds and music, and really, you know, we're talking about a guy who single-handedly invented the genre of ambient music, right? I mean, who would deny it at this point? Um, This guy is a friggin' genius, you know? He's (laughs) really, you know, he's next level, you know, at all times. And I think he gets better with age, Um, I often listen to him just speak, you know, just talking about the process of making new music and his approaches and his ideas and how he looks at it, how he hears it. And uh, it's just, you know, I was turned on to Brian Eno by a guy a long time ago who I don't speak to anymore, but I'll tell you what. I'm grateful that he turned me on to Brian Eno, and I still, even though I don't talk to that dude anymore, I still listen to Brian Eno. And he, just as much as Michael Cretu, Enya, U2, and a couple of the other bands that I'm going to talk about, uh, has influenced and inspired me and is a hero to me, like, at all times. It, he never gets old. He never fades away. He stays fresh. He's right in the forefront of my existence at all times. And uh, I can't say enough about it. I mean, I was given the Apollo CD, Brian, you know, Apollo CD, by that dude I was talking about so many years ago. And right away from the very first opening track of that CD, uh, Everything changed. Everything changed. There's only been a handful of those. And man, that was one of them. And uh, I would say with somebody like Brian Eno, what I admire about him most is really not his music, although I admire it a great deal. What I really admire is his spirit and his approach and his ideas and his attitude about creating and generating new sounds not just music but new sounds sound design you know he is a master at that and uh, he's in my hip pocket at all times something to aspire to something to try to be like you know maybe not sonically maybe not sounding just like him but approaching this whole thing with a certain kind of almost scientific attitude, you know, and being open to new ideas and being truly creative, you know? I'm sure, really, if you're a musician who records your own music, 
at some point, Eno has kind of like been inserted or injected into your formula somehow, right? And yeah, you might not be making ambient music or something like that, but he's in there, you know, he's, he's that brilliant and he's that kind of musician, you know, a music scientist, really. Um, and, you know, I want to say really quick, you know, I mentioned the Cocteau Twins, how I rediscovered them. But, you know, what I didn't really emphasize, I think, enough is exactly how uh, creative and interesting the voice, you know, the vocals of Elizabeth Fraser are to me. Like when I listen to them, when I listen to Cocteau Twins, the music is really great music. Okay, but what really intrigues me and really kind of sets me off, all right, it makes me want to go into the studio and record, is like when I hear what she's doing with her voice, because I'm a singer too, okay, I make the music and all that stuff, but singing like with your voice and playing the guitar are really very different, separate things, and I find it kind of like with guitar or piano or something like that, it's much easier to get to where you need to go on an instrument rather than with your voice. It's like a whole different animal. And I wouldn't say that I've struggled with it, okay, but it did take me a long, 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 long time to kind of like get to where I am. I'm not a natural singer, and I would say, honestly, um, most of the time I think I get pretty close to the target, but um, my process and my, uh, I guess my process in conflict with my aspirations has kind of forced me to kind of like formulate my own way, okay? Like, I can't get to where I want to go. So, like, how can I compensate, you know? And somebody like Elizabeth Fraser is an inspiration to me because her approach to singing is so odd and so unusual and so very, very different from any other singers that have ever lived. I'm serious. I mean, this is a woman who would come up to the microphone and, I mean, it's been reported... Okay, that she wouldn't even sometimes be singing words, you know, that she would be making noises with her mouth. And when you listen to these tracks that she's laid down, these beautiful layers of these really melodic and just amazing choices of notes and where to go and what to do, uh, unprecedented. Enya's a little bit different to me, you know, obviously. She's a lot more proper, a lot more traditional. But Elizabeth Fraser, oh my gosh. You know, each song is a revelation, and it's certainly an inspiration, you know, when you're trying to be a creative singer. So, there you go, Liz Fraser. Oof. Man, I know for a fact that there are people listening to this podcast right now that know exactly what I'm talking about. Because they hear the same damn thing when they listen to Cocteau Twins. Unprecedented, unmatched. To this day, nobody has gotten close. Um, Although I would say, as a side note, I think there's a song by Adele called Send My Love to Your Lover. I think that's the title. I'm a little embarrassed that I don't know for sure. But... uh, I think Adele was attempting a Liz Frazier thing. And I would bet dollars to donuts that if you asked her, she would admit it. Like, yeah, I had been listening to Cocteau Twins and I thought I would go for it. Because, uh, listen to that track. Send my love to your lover or send my love to your next lover. And, uh, you tell me. Okay, do you hear Cocteau Twins? Because I do. Um, okay, so onward and upward. Let's see, I've covered... A little bit of the list. (laughs) 
I got so many. Whoa, I'm going to go a little bit off the rails here, I guess, a little bit, but... Oh, no. Okay, I suppose. What I'll do, just for the sake of continuity, okay, um, we're going to talk about a couple of other bands really quick. The first one I'm going to talk about is Depeche Mode. Okay, yeah, and I know that, you know, Depeche Mode, U2, Brian Eno, Jeff Lynne, you know, these are all Tom Petty. Okay, these are all very highly successful commercial artists. Not a whole lot of underground happening here. But, you know, I'm a white boy from the suburbs of Cleveland, you know? So, uh, give me a break, right? And uh, also, too, um, I would say that uh, there's nothing wrong with um, something being commercially successful and, you know, there's no conflict there. It could still be good to me. You know, I'm not too cool for it. So, um, I see commercial success as a sign that whatever this artist is doing is obviously reaching many people and touching many people. And that's not a bad thing. Okay, so having said that, onward. Depeche Mode. Okay. Very commercially successful. Everybody knows who they are now. Okay, but there was a time, believe me, when not too many people had heard about them. And uh, I was one of them. And I happened to know a girl who was from where I lived. She grew up near where I lived. And she had moved to California. Okay. And maybe a couple years later, she came back to visit. And one of the things she brought back to my little posse of friends, okay, was this band that was really popular out in California called Depeche Mode. And she played for me for the very first time ever, okay? She played for me their song, People Are People, okay? And yeah, it was a big hit. I know, everybody knows it now, but at the time, it was unknown, okay? And I was a young drummer, you know, practicing my drums all the time. And I cared really... I didn't care much about anything else, <laughs> okay? When I was about 12, you know, 14, like in that range, man, I was single-minded, <laughs> okay? And when I first heard People Are People... Oh my gosh, it was a game changer. Like, I wasn't even sure exactly what they were doing. Like, how are they getting this rhythm track that they have? You know, the, I don't know, that industrial clanging thing that they were doing. Oh my gosh, it was like, I had to just keep listening to it over and over again. Like, okay, somebody just rewrote the drum book you know, uh, how to drum, or what a rhythm track is, like, what the hell is this, you know, um, and like I said, now, you've heard it so much that it's like, yeah, whatever, it's like, uh, it's a cliche, man, you know, no, 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 let's go back in time a little and remember how fresh that rhythm track was, and actually, when you really think about it, what it meant for the rest of the world as far as, you know, what, industrial music or whatever music made with found sounds you know these rhythm tracks that are constructed of samples yeah it got copied over and over and over again in the future but really it was kind of like started by guys like that way back in the day go back and listen and for me Depeche Mode wow what they evolved into you know um uh, I mean, they started out with these really kind of wonky, you know, cheesy keyboard sounds because that's what was available, right? They worked with what they had. But by the time they got to songs of faith and devotion, which in my opinion is their peak, like, oh my gosh, that album, right? Have you heard it? Do you know what I'm talking about? Depeche Mode, songs of faith and devotion track for track one song after another of just magnificence perfection you know sonic perfection uh, developed to the highest level recorded in the best studio by a band that was at the top of their game 
right? And really at the top of a genre that they really started, if you ask me. Um, that album was just like, wow, a masterpiece. That was the album they were always working towards. And let me tell you, in my opinion, they got there. <laughs> they got there, man. That album to this day stands up to any other album that comes out. I mean, they were just, whew. okay, enough about that. Depeche Mode, Songs of Faith and Devotion, do yourself a favor and go back and listen to it, especially, okay, two tracks off that album that just, whoa. There's a song called Rush and a song called In Your Room. And oh my goodness, did that change the game for me, you know? A whole new horizon, a whole new level, a whole new bar to try to reach as a musician. And I'll probably never get there, but that's okay. I'll keep trying, you know. Um, next up, man, maybe this band should have been first on the list. I, I don't know, because they're pretty major to me, okay? But the Mission UK. Now, I know I did an episode way back in the day. I think a Snowflake 33 episode where I talked about their song, The Garden of Delight. Okay. But that's really not really where the story ends. It does not encapsulate the greatness of this band um, because there's just so much. Um, as a drummer, okay, Mick Brown, the drummer for the Mission UK. Uh, probably one of my biggest influences on the drums. Uh, not necessarily because of the complexity or anything like that, the sophistication of his drum tracks, which there's plenty of that in his drumming, trust me. Okay. But it was more this idea of hitting the drums, you know, like killing them, smacking them loud, you know, ACDC loud drums um, that really kind of is compelling to me even to this day you know uh, when a drummer is really hitting them you know it's almost kind of like there are fads I mean you may or may not know this you probably don't because you probably aren't a drummer or whatever you probably don't even care okay but in the world of drummers as far as I'm concerned uh, there's like these eras you know these fads of technique and what's popular and you know the way to be now like for instance how people were drumming in the 90s is very different to how drummers were drumming in the 2000s like there are things that come and go all right and right now as we speak we live in a time where there's either fake drumming Okay, like they're not even real drums. Like you don't care because you're just listening, you know, you're just dancing to it. But to me, it's bothersome sometimes because it all sounds the same. You know, there's no real drum sounds anymore. But I have to say there are a handful of bands that are emerging right now that are kind of ushering in a change, okay, of drumming technique and that John Bonham-esque hard-hitting delivery is happening again with bands like the Rival Sons and I hate to admit it but Greta Von Fleet who I'll just leave it there I won't say anything bad because I know a lot of people like them just don't ask me what I think um, but I do admire the idea of the drummers of this next generation that are coming up you know, putting a little sweat and muscle behind it. Not this light-handed, pansy-ass, you know, approach to the instrument. It's a percussion instrument. You're supposed to hit it, you know? Now, I understand nuance. Yes, I understand. I can hear the drummer screaming, ah! You know, technical nuance and things like that. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Good luck with that. That's not what I'm interested in. And that is why I like Mick Brown from the Mission UK. Because, yeah, he had his subtleties and his little inventive things he did. And he had, 
you know, light-handed percussion sometimes, conga drums and those kinds of things to enhance the mood. But for the most part, it was crack and thud, kick and snare drums. Like, not playing around, not joking around. As serious as a heart attack, attacking the instrument, and you can feel it in your chest. You know, you put the CD on, you go see him at concert, whatever. You're feeling the drums more than you're hearing them. That's the way it should be done, if you ask me, okay? Now, that's the drums of the Mission UK. I haven't even gotten to the guitars or the vocals yet, okay? But we're gonna go to the guitars right now because probably, like, if the edge was an influence on my guitar playing, if that were the case, which I would suspect at this point, it was. Um, the guitar playing from Simon Hinkler and Wayne Hussey, two guitar players playing off of each other in these Mission UK songs, let me tell you something, okay? These two dudes as a team, one, without question, they reinvented the 12-string acoustic guitar. If you don't believe me, go back and listen to uh, Heaven on Earth off the Children album, okay? Tower of Strength off the Children album. Those two songs, by the way, are joined together on the album. They're continuous play. So, you know, you can press play at the beginning of Heaven on Earth and then it segues into Tower of Strength. Probably, like, in my opinion, maybe the pinnacle of their guitar playing, like what was possible sonically. And uh, these two guys, Simon Hinkler, Wayne Hussey from the Mission UK, Whatever they were doing, I don't know what they were smoking, I don't know what it was in the water or whatever, but they were reinventing guitar playing, okay? Um, in a very beautiful and impressive and inspirational way, okay? And if you listen to anything I play on the guitar, it is undeniable that the spirit of Wayne Hussey Simon Hinkler and all of those Mission UK albums that I listened to over the years live in my playing. And I'm proud of it. One, because they don't get enough credit in my book, but also because it sounds so damn good. <laughs> it's just so good, you know? Okay, Mission UK, drums, guitar. Now we're gonna talk vocals. Now we're gonna talk lyrics, okay? Because man, Oh man, did this guy change everything for me. Singing, writing lyrics, being a poet, being creative with your words. Um, just uh, vocal subtlety, uh, whisper to a scream, uh, power, projection, passion. Uh, I just could go on and on, which I can't because I run out of time, but it's like I can't say enough. Uh, there are a lot of people who say that the Mission UK sounded a lot like U2. Eh, I guess so. You know, like if you have, you know, a very limited palette, I would say yes, that's true. But not really. Not to me. They're so different that if I were to sit here and try to point out the differences, I would run out of time. So I'm not going to go there, but Suffice it to say that I believe that the Mission UK really just had their own thing going on. They did. Still do, but uh, I haven't heard much of their new stuff, I will say. Not all of what I've heard has been bad, though, but back in the day, I don't know, man. Unsurpassed in my book. Their albums from back in the 1980s and maybe even into the 90s a little bit, but mostly in the 80s. They stand up to any album that comes out now. No question. They're, they're actually even better because they were pre-software, you know? So the sounds are more organic and raw. And uh, yeah, they sound dated, I guess, but not really. Go back and take a listen uh, to the album Children, like I said. Um, just an amazing album produced by John Paul Jones from Led Zeppelin. So you get that lush, orchestral kind of sound. I mean, it just was like a marriage made in heaven. 
the Mission UK, John Paul Jones, awesome studio, great microphones. Oh my goodness. Two inch tape. Oh man, they are treasures to be rediscovered, folks. Do yourself a favor. Take it from me, the guy who knows nothing. <laughs> I'm having a great time today. <laughs> I'm really happy that the Singularity Podcast has made it this far. Oh, okay, so music, 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 so much music. Now, I'm going to go to my final two inspirational music acts. Okay, I'm going to start with the earlier one in my childhood, really. And, you know, there was a lot of Metallica. There was a lot of Ozzy. There was a lot of all that hair metal, all that stuff. You know, I, I lived through it. And trust me, not all of it's bad. But I was introduced to King Diamond by my older brother, Steve, the knucklehead, the crazy guy, hilarious guy. Um, he turned me on to King Diamond. And at first, the first time I heard King Diamond, I was a little scared. I'll admit it. It was pretty creepy. Okay. But the music was compelling. His voice was a little challenging at times, but I got what he was doing. I could appreciate what he was going for. And it didn't sound like anyone else still doesn't. So, and no one can take that away. I mean, he is doing his own thing on that microphone. But what I liked about King Diamond the most was his drummer. Okay. He had a drummer called Mickey D. He played drums for King Diamond. Then he went to uh, Motorhead until Lemmy died. And I think now he's playing for the Scorpions. Like he's touring with them. But this guy, as a drummer, okay, uh, was a machine. Yeah, he was a machine. He is totally unsung does not get enough credit. Um, In my opinion, he is the most challenging rock drummer that has ever lived. He's still alive and still playing. And let me tell you something. He hasn't lost any of his energy over the course of his career. In fact, if anything, not only has he maintained his level of energy and power and control behind that instrument, but I think he's actually kind of augmented it a little and actually gotten better as he's gotten older. If you don't believe me, type in Mickey D drum solo on YouTube and just see for yourself. M-I-K-K-E-E-D-E-E. Mickey D drum solo. Check it out. The guy is superhuman. Okay. And I don't care what anybody else says. Okay. Because let me tell you, I've been drumming for a long time and I've seen and heard so many drummers that I really paid attention to I really investigated I really cared about but man when it comes to (laughs) next level drumming okay (laughs) that's the guy and I would imagine that you know he'll probably never be surpassed I don't know. Carter Buford from Dave Matthews Band comes pretty close to that level. But Carter Buford is a little more subdued. Mickey D, the guy from King Diamond, Motorhead, and now the Scorpions. uh, He's just like, you know. (laughs) Watch the drum solo. See for yourself. It's next level drumming. Okay. And last but not least... One of the bands that has made my radar over the past 10 years that are really important to me and uh, they astound me is Rammstein, the band from Germany. Man, they sing in German, can't understand a damn thing he's singing about, but for some reason it doesn't matter. Now you got to really think about that, okay? I guess what you really have to think about now that I'm saying it is this is a band from Germany who does not sing in English yet can sell out Madison Square Garden two or three nights in a row. Now think about that. A band from Germany coming to America and selling out Madison Square Garden in New York, not once, 
not twice, like three nights in a row. Just think about that. The audience speaks English, the band sings German. You gotta be pretty damn good to pull that off. And let me tell you folks, they are the real deal. Now there are a lot of musicians and artists that have influenced me whatever, okay? But honestly and truly, when it comes to playing guitar and that kind of stuff, especially with pipe choir, not so much with PC3 or PC1, okay? Um, I aspire <laughs> to what Rammstein are doing on the guitars. Now, I forget the two guitar players' names. That's probably a bad thing, but um, it doesn't really matter. Like, uh, they are more creative and more powerful than most other bands you're going to find nowadays. I mean, they just are, they are creating music that is more compelling and powerful and heavy. I mean, really heavy. Not fast, not death metal. That's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about that. We're talking about heavy, heavy. They are the best example of what heavy metal could become and has become. They are state-of-the-art, cutting-edge heavy metal. Because if you ask me, I mean, yeah, there's armies of speed metal bands, death metal bands. They mean nothing to me. Speed means nothing to me. Okay? It's about power. That's what people don't get about heavy metal. Like the people who don't like heavy metal, it's not about being loud. It's not about being dark. It's about having power and projecting it, riding the lightning, so to speak, as a much more famous and talented singer once said. You know, think about that. That's what Rammstein, to me, represents, and that's what they inspire me to do. They inspire me to want to be heavier on my guitar and to come up with riffs and things like that that are really just compelling and just sound wicked, you know? Listen to their tracks, man. They have this one song called To Der Wick. I don't even know if I'm saying it right. Live at Madison Square Garden. They film the concerts. And let me tell you, once a week maybe, I watch the video just to, just to make sure, you know, it was as good as I thought it was. Um, wow, you know? Uh, metal done right <laughs> in a modern way. Uh, the top of their game right now. At the top of their game. They just released a new album. And they have a couple singles. And of course the videos are all dark and violent and morbid. But the music, man. Yeah. Don't need the videos so much. But the, the songs, the guitars, what they're doing. Two dudes, you know, playing in stereo. One on each side of your headphones. Wow. Do yourself a favor. I mean, just the distortion, the tone of their guitars even, you know? <sighs> Something to aspire to. Wow, Rammstein. Okay, so now that we've covered that part of the music thing, I'll finish off with a couple of honorable mentions. And these go back to my infancy, really, because I grew up in a house with older brothers and sisters and they were always kind of playing me music and stuff and they'd be playing their records and I would be listening and reacting and you know all that so uh, the first band that I would mention that I find inspiring even now when I hear it it kind of takes me back to my childhood and I can also hear how those songs influenced me but not in an overt way they were kind of subconsciously there Okay, and one of the bands I have to mention is Foreigner. Uh, yeah, they're kind of like, you know, a commercial band, whatever. But, uh, and they're, you know, really, they're on the nostalgia circuit now. But their new singer is actually pretty damn good. Pretty good singer. Uh, of course, he wouldn't have the job if he wasn't great, right? 
But uh, really sad about Lou Graham, you know, what happened to him and his health and everything. He's still alive, still kicking, but he went through a thing, you know. But uh, when I was a kid, those albums were being played constantly. And uh, one of the first albums I owned, that I personally owned, was Foreigner 4. You know, I cared about their music and I liked it. Um, and I don't listen to a whole lot of it now, although I do have their greatest hits and every once in a while it'll pop up and I'll listen to it, whatever, you know. Uh, great songs, you know, well-written songs and really interesting in a lot of ways. But, oh my gosh, it's like, uh, you know, my formative years. Before I picked up an instrument, you know, whoa, Foreigner is in there. And of course, last but not least, you know, the cliche at this point, and everybody says it, but Kiss, you know, it was Kiss, man. When I was a kid, that's what it was all about. <laughs> they were superhuman. They, they weren't human. And uh, Peter Chris, <sighs> without Peter Chris, there would be no me. I would have wound up being like a dentist or something, or I don't know. I would probably be selling insurance or something. I'm not sure, but I would not have been a musician, most likely. So, love you, Peter. Thank you so much for the inspiration. <laughs> Thank you for being a walking, talking comic book character. Um, yeah. So there you go. Pretty long list. And, and now, uh, you know, I'm going to talk about a couple of other heroes and inspirations I have outside of music. Okay, we're going to go into politics a little bit. We're going to go into spiritual heroes and inspirations, right? And a couple of artists, painters that have influenced me and inspired me and are heroes to me. But that's going to be in the next episode. So, sorry folks, hate to cut it off here, but we've got a lot more territory to cover. So for now... This is Mike Bostwick from Pipe Choir Records signing off. And remember, folks, if you want to keep what you've got, you've got to give it away. Take it easy. <laughs>